risk assessment and reoffending, and I am here to talk about uh, the risk assessment uh, part of this, to give kind of a primer on risk assessment. I thought I would do three things. First is talk about a couple of definitional issues so we're all on the same page as to what risk assessment means, then to do a quick survey of current approaches to the task of risk assessment, and finally to give uh, an illustration of previous research that the MacArthur Foundation has done uh, on this topic. So. The best definition of risk assessment I've ever encountered is one by Helena Kramer here at Stanford. The process of using risk factors to estimate the likelihood, that is the probability, of an outcome occurring in a population. Now, in the context of criminal sentencing, that outcome you're trying to, uh, whose risk you're trying to assess could be crime in general, or it could be more specifically violent crime, or perhaps still more specifically sexually violent crime. The populations upon whom risk assessment is being practiced could be defendants at the time of sentencing, taking likelihood of future crime into account, or it could be inmates at the time of parole. Right. The key issue is what do we mean by risk factor? And here the thing to be clear on is to say that A is a risk factor for B means two things and two things alone. It means that A and B statistically correlate when A tends to go up, B tends to go up, when A tends to go down, B tends to go down. And secondly, it means that A comes before B in time. So if you have statistical correlation and you have a temporal order, then you have a risk factor. What this, what this does not mean is that the risk factor is in any sense causal. It doesn't mean if you can change A that that will change the probability of B. If that were the case, the risk factor would have to be changeable, would have to be variable, you'd have to know how to change it, and when you change it, you'd have to observe a change in crime. Right? That is very, very difficult to do. Risk assessment is actually much, uh, much easier than this. So that's ex what we mean by risk assessment, again, is using, these risk, fac using risk factors to anticipate uh, an outcome. In terms of approaches to the field, right? I, current approaches go from very clinical, depending on experts, to much more structured. Clinical prediction has been around for a long time. This study uh, was done in Maryland in 1972. It was one of the first, and it's still one of the best studies. It was done on people sentenced for a violent crime to indeterminate sentences. They were then sent to a place in Maryland, and they were evaluated for several months by a team of psychiatrists uh, and psychologists. At the end of that time, the team told the court what their judgment was, and if they predicted the person would be violent, of course, usually the person was kept in this forensic hospital. If they said they were safe, they were oftentimes released, but a, thereby you couldn't study them. But for a couple of hundred people, even though the clinician said this person's likely to be violent, for technical legal reasons, they had to be released, poor Miranda warnings or something. But what that did is it allowed there to be a study to see how accurate were the clinicians, right? And the criterion here is re-arrest for an FBI violent index crime, murder, rape, robbery, or assault within five years. Of the people whom the clinicians said are likely to be safe, nonviolent, in that five-year period, 8% of those people were re-arrested for a violent index crime. Of the people that they said were going to be violent, 35% were arrested for a violent index crime. Now, I mean, this is not chopped liver. This is not so bad. I mean, 8 is much, 35 is much bigger then eight, it was not like the clinicians had no experience in doing this, no expertise in doing this. I mean, if you could perform this well at the task of playing craps, then my suggestion is, you know, after the meeting's over tomorrow, just fly, don't go home, go to Vegas, right? Because you will be rich by dinner tomorrow night if you could do this well at that task. But I think there's been a consensus in the field for the past 40 years that given the uses, the legal uses to which these risk assessments are put, given that we're civilly committing people to mental hospitals against their will, given that many states are using risk assessment in sentencing. My own state of Virginia executes people who've been convicted, two things, they've been convicted of certain kind of heinous felonies and they are predicted to be likely to do it again, if not executed. That given what we are doing, not even to mention the civil Tarasov kind of uh, consequences here, that this simply wasn't good enough. And the notion was, if we could decompose the task, the process of violence risk assessment, kind of try to carve it at its joints and then see what we could do to structure or to organize each of those parts, then maybe that would be the way uh, forward. So I think you can decompose 
the violence risk assessment process into four, four different components. First, you have to identify the risk factors. Which factors do you have reason to believe both A, correlate with crime, and B, come before crime in time? You have to decide how you're going to measure those risk factors. Shall it just be yes or no, or shall it be on a three-point scale or a ten-point scale, for example? You have to decide how are we going to combine these risk factors. Are we just going to add them up? Should some of them get more points than others? Maybe some should be yes, no. Others should be on a ten-point scale. We have to decide that. And then, finally, you have to decide what is your ultimate estimate of violence risk? Is it just you just combine the risk factors and go with what the computer says, or is there a role for uh, human beings? And what we found in recent years is a variety of tools, instruments, that structure one, two, three, or all four of these components of the violence risk assessment process. So for example, this is examples of increasingly structured violence risk assessment, right? Identify risk factors, identify and measure them, identify, measure, and combine them, and then produce the final risk estimate. Look at clinical prediction, just like the slide I just showed. That doesn't structure anything. The psychologist or psychiatrist, based on his or her own clinical experience or perhaps a professional uh, theoretical uh, school to which they belong, they might measure one risk factor in one person and one in the other, in a different person. And again, this is not, as you see, entirely useless, but it doesn't structure anything. If you look at a standard list of risk factors, if you look at any modern psychiatric text, It'll say, if you want to predict violence to others, you might don't forget to interview the person about the following things. Has he ever thought about being violent? Has he ever been violent uh, before? Has he ever been in jail? Right. Uh, but don't forget this. It, so it identifies risk factors, some 10, some more. But it doesn't tell you how to measure them. I mean, does the threat of violence count more or less than a previous act of violence, or how to combine them, or what to do at the end of the day? Take this, the HCR-28 stands for Historical, Clinical, and Risk Management. It's 20 questions about your past, about your current functioning, and about your likely future functioning. That, it tells you which 20 things to ask about, and it tells you how to measure them. You give the person a zero if the risk factor is definitely not there. You give the person a two if the risk factor definitely is there. And you give the person a one if it's there a little bit, or you think maybe it's there and you're not quite sure. But it says you shouldn't combine them. Just don't add, just add up to 20. Because one of those risk factors may be enough to trump all the other ones. If, for example, the risk factor is a threat, and the threat is, as soon as I get out, I'm going to kill the judge. Well, the, you scored now two points on that scale. And that's gonna, <laughs> but that's enough. <laughs> you agree, right? Put them away for that one reason. Right, <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, the classification of violence risk, about which a few more words in a minute. Uh, that instrument, which is software, computerized software, identifies the risk factors, tells you how to measure the risk factors, and combines the risk factors in a tree-type design. If you're high in one risk factor, then it'll ask you some more. And if you're low in risk factor, it'll ask you different questions. But the view here is that at the end of the day, humans, I was going to say judges, but in quotation marks, meaning <laughs> clinicians, right? Uh, uh, should be able to override this if they really if they have good reason to override it. You shouldn't just go with the numbers. And finally, this is DRAG, the Violence Risk Appraisal Guide, which is used in many insanity cases. This is a purely statistical instrument. Their view is you ask about these 12 risk factors. It tells you how to measure them. It tells you how to combine them. And it says once you've combined them, you shut up and you sit down. You do not tweak it because if you tweak it clinically, you are more likely to reduce its accuracy than you are to increase its accuracy. Sometimes maybe you'll increase it, and for every time you make it more accurate, there'll be two times that you made it less accurate. So that, I think, is the array of current approaches in the field, from having no components of the violence risk assessment process through one here, two, three, and all four here. The one that I favor, the cover, is the one that I was involved in in the first uh, MacArthur Network on uh, Law and Mental Health, where I was involved with uh, Steve Morse and Lori producing this. Our view is that it is human judgment at the end of the day is necessary. Sometimes it can screw things up, no doubt whatsoever. But there may be rare risk factors that precisely because they're rare will simply not show up in a computer program, in a statistical table. And I must say, I got uh, from my son for Christmas a book by Nate Silver, who runs the New York Times, column 538. And I was extremely pleased to come across this. The National Weather Service keeps two different sets of books, one that shows how well computers are doing by themselves, and another that 
uh, accounts for how much value the human meteorologists contribute. According to the statistics, humans improve the accuracy of precipitation forecasts by about 25% over computer guidance alone, and temperature forecasts by about 10%. So I think that humans in forecasting the weather, oftentimes, of course, the meteorologists just stand out the window and say, you know, it actually is raining, you know, and I don't care what the model said, my hand is wet, right? But it works. It works, right? right. Um, so I think that there is reason to rely on human judgment, and I think most real judges are much more comfortable with this. So for the illustration, the classification of violence risk uh, that the MacArthur Foundation uh, funded, what we did here in the MacArthur Violence Risk Assessment Study, we had about a, actually 1,136 patients who were discharged from short-term psychiatric facilities. About half of these people had a history of uh, arrest. Many of them were in the hospital because they were believed to be dangerous to others, although not all of them. We measured 134 risk factors when people were in the hospital. Anything that people had written about, that there was some survey of clinicians, anything that clinicians believed to be risk factors, we wanted to validate and see which things actually predict violence and which things don't. We followed people up in the community after discharge. Uh, we got their self-report after having gotten a federal confidentiality certificate, which was an experience. Uh, we got the uh, word of a collateral, usually a family member who knew them well in the community. We got their arrest records, and we got the, rec the records from their <coughs> mental hospital. So for a real-world study, I don't know how much more comprehensive you're going to be than asking a person, asking somebody who knows them well, asking the police, and asking that the individual therapist. We here define violence as one of four things. Right? The use of a weapon, <clears throat> threat with a weapon in your hand when you make the threat. Without the weapon, we didn't count that, because many people speak in terms of threats. Right? Battery that resulted in physical injury, at least a bruise, or any form of sexual assault. That's what we meant <coughs> by violence. So. What did we find? Well, we divided the risk factors into four categories. The first category might be, you say, what the person is. Age. For each one-year increase in age, the probability of violence decreased by 20%. The first thing I've encountered that's good about getting older. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Thank God for small favors. Right? All right. Anger control. The one standard deviation increase in the Navaco anger con uh, control instrument increased violence by 52%. The item on that most specifically is, uh, when I get mad, I throw things. Don't do that. Don't do that, right? Because that is actually quite uh, predictive of later uh, violence. And gender, men in this study were 51% more likely to be violent than women, right? Second category, what the person has, like a major mental disorder, right? We had people here, we had a control group, right, of people in the, in the same neighborhoods as the patient lives uh, who had never been hospitalized. In terms of defining violence the way I just gave, one of those four things, in the 10-week period, about 5% of the people in the general community had been committed at least one violent act. This were discharged patients with schizophrenia, patients with bipolar disorder, and these were patients with depression that had the highest rates. All of these rates are statistically significantly higher than the general population. Some people are surprised sometimes that people with schizophrenia are at the highest, but of course a lot of these people might not have left their house because they were maybe too paranoid to go out, right? Personality disorder, right? Not a major mental illness, but something like, for example, antisocial personality disorder, which is not the same as, but bears some resemblance to psychopathy, which was mentioned many times earlier today. And in fact, the graph we just saw, this is the personality disorder. 23% of those people committed at least one violent act, so it was higher than any kind of a major mental illness and much higher than the uh, comparison group, right? Uh, substance abuse disorder, right? Okay, here are the community group and the patients, uh, after they get the patients have to go to the hospital, the green, these are people without any symptoms of substance abuse, right? You can see 3.3 and 4.7, there is no statistically significant difference. If patients were not abusing substances after they got out of the hospital, they were as safe as their non-mentally ill neighbors. I wish we could stop there, right? But in Pittsburgh, right? In Pittsburgh, yes. In Pittsburgh, yeah. <laughs> in Pittsburgh. If you look at people who had at least one symptom of alcohol or drug abuse, right? So here for the general community group, violence rate goes from 3% to 11%. So you heard it here first, drugs are not good for anybody. But for people who have mental illness, it goes, it doubles that, it's 22%. For whatever reason, if your brain is already kind of, has a tenuous enough grasp on reality, the last thing you want to do is further scramble it. So substance abuse came through very strongly, right? Prior crime and violence, 
Here, the total sample, 19% of the people were violent. People with no prior arrests, it was 9% violent. People with prior nonviolent arrests, 20% violent. Prior violent arrests, 36% violent. As every, almost every other study has always found, the single best predictor of future violence is past violence, to no one's uh, surprise. In terms of the fourth category, what's been done to the person, pathological family environment, your self-report that when you were growing up, before you were 15, your father used drugs at home to excess. That doubled your odds of being violent to other people when you became an adult. And finally, victimization. If when you were growing up, again, before you were 15, you were seriously physically abused as a child, such that you had to go to a doctor or miss school, right, that increased your rates of being violent by 51. If you put all that together, we could put people in one of five groups that had a 1%, 8%, 26 56 or 76% chance of being violent to others in a 20-week period after discharge. These are the 95% confidence intervals. And a study that was just published uh, last year used this instrument in Sweden. And what you find is, here's the MacArthur data, the American data here, and the darker ones are the data that they found in Sweden. And you see that the instrument, in an ordinal way, it's here's the highest, goes down, 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 and down. But the rates of violence are also much lower in Sweden. This is 76% in the US, the highest risk, and it's only 50% here. In the US, the second highest group was 56%. Here, it's about 28% because Sweden is just a much safer place to live <laughs> than the United States, which is great if you want to be a citizen and live there. If you're a violence risk assessment researcher, it's not the place to, uh, <laughs> to, 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 to So, thank you. Right. thank you.